is the most amazing Renaissance man. He's been hosting inside edge sort of gatherings for 33 years. So he actually started before we did. <laughs> and he does this weekly uh, and sometimes twice a week. And so Ted and I went out there and he has this one huge room upstairs that is filled with his holographic art. It's 3D art. I mean, you are standing in the middle of the most amazing mystical experience up there, and it's just jaw-dropping, as is our speaker this morning. I'm not going to even try to explain who he is and what he does. Please give a warm welcome to Lee McCloskey. Thank you, Diana, and uh, I am delighted to be here with all of you at uh, uh, your, your meeting of storytellers and people interested in the curiosity of this remarkable world. And I, I am very delighted uh, that I was asked to come here and I'm very honored by it. So thank you very much. And what I've done today to try and live up to that rep the, uh, the introduction <laughs> is to put together slides and a conversation about art and archetype and really what I've discovered over a lifetime of asking, how do we discover what is our, in our inheritance as human beings? How can we make sense of our story, not just by what is around us, but what have we inherited from those who came before us? So for 33 years, I realized that the conversation I was having in Hollywood as an actor was one conversation, and it really wasn't interested in my critique, but it offered me a great opportunity to have a home and in that home to begin to gather people like ourselves that said, well, let's use this time to encourage one another, to nurture one another's uh, curiosity rather than to critique one another or to spend countless hours figuring out what's wrong with the world rather than figuring out, well, maybe what can we bring to the world? How can we improve the conversation rather than having a conversation about what's lacking in the conversation? And so what I wanted to do was to bring us in, and again, just to take us on a journey. Let's just set the stage. And uh, William Blake, of course, is the greatest stage setter there is in terms of entering into our imagination, into an agreement that says, at least for a little while, let's suspend our disbelief and enter into the possibility of things. To open the eternal worlds, to open the immortal eyes of man inwards into the worlds of thought, into eternity ever expanding in the bosom of God, the human imagination. And Joseph Campbell, and this is one of the lines that I think really has always resonated with me. He said, the artists of every generation must reinvigorate the myths. And why we know this to be so true is that in the arts is where we are not asking about belief we are asking about ensemble. We are asking about how do we create stories that inspire us so that when we look at the past, we're not looking at something dead and lifeless, but we're really looking at the tools and the possibility that as we engage that with our imagination, it will awaken once again through us uniquely. And really, this is the story of my art. I have used my art as a way of asking questions about the nature of consciousness. I realized that to enter creation, we must use creation. To know love, we must love. And if we stand on the outside, we can critique, we can judge, and we can be journalists, and we can represent the facts, but we'll never get to the heart of things. And really, the inquiry into depth is the trusting of our imagination. And this is why all of us, I believe, is uh, an artist of consciousness and that an artist of consciousness approaches life with a great curiosity. And this is another William Blake uh, quote that I believe really sets a tone for probably most of us. I must create a system of my own or be enslaved by another man's. And that question of what are my beliefs, what am I allowing others to tell me I must believe, and how do I find my own voice? And this is why today's talk about Thoth's library, the hieroglyph of the human soul, art, archetype, and visual philosophia, 
with me, Lee J. McCloskey, <laughs> is um, really entering into what Diana was saying, this great curiosity that is my painted library studio and wonder study, the hieroglyph of the human soul, which began on 9-11 when the towers came down. What you're going to see today is not something I expected to create and something like having a child where you're just stunned when it is born because you realize how little you actually had to do with it in terms of figuring it out. Yours was to midwife it, to allow it to be born through you because what you were giving birth to was not something that was an object but actually a living being, an entity that said, now I am here to stimulate the human imagination. And this is why Thoth's library, The Hieroglyph of the Human Soul, it announced, my studio announced itself as the hieroglyph of the human soul. I will get into the Thoth's relationship as we get into the slides because it's a fascinating and very unexpected journey. As a matter of fact, I've realized that what we consider genius is actually a whole lot of oops. <laughs> it's really not figuring it out. You're putting it together as best you can and you, something falls on the floor and you go, oops. Oh, that's very interesting. So I, I'm kind of getting the sense that maybe that's how God created creation. It was really, he had just a bunch of inks standing around. He kicked one of them. Stars came out of the ink bottle all over the place. I know that because I've kicked a few ink bottles across my studio and seen star systems come out over the, uh, the books, as it were. So, and I wanted to just say about art, archetype, and visual philosophia, what I mean about that. Because a lot of times we use words that have such a general sense, we don't really know what we're talking about. And when I talk about art, I really like to approach art not as something, not as an object, not as a, a, as a cultural conversation, but as much a, more as an approach. That art is our capacity as human beings to step into the curiosity of a question, to not have a pre-formulated idea of how it will be, but actually saying, what may I learn from you? This is the art of living. The art of living is based on being curious about life, as opposed to certain, and in that certainty, you spend your life trying to essentially justify that certainty, so we become very narrowed. And this is where the arts are very helpful because this is the one place that says, and guess what, you don't have to believe any of this. So this is not against you, this is actually helping you to understand what the archetypes are trying to teach us. Many of us don't really know, we hear the word archetype, we know Jung, we know Campbell talking about the archetype, but one of the best ways I found to address archetype is this sense of, as an actor, if we see a hundred actors play Hamlet, we see Hamlet in each of those performances. And if we have a conversation after we see the performance of those unique Hamlets, we'll learn something about Hamlet. And each will reveal something different to us. But if we step back, we realize that Hamlet itself transcends any of the performances of Hamlet. Like a tuning fork, that when the actor enters the role, we strike the tuning fork and our curiosity, our sense of possibility begins to, in a sense, interface with this quality that gestates, grows, and therefore if Hamlet comes through me, it's a very different Hamlet than if it comes through uh, uh, Kenneth Branagh or Mel Gibson. We have these examples that are saying why this is important is that when we understand this, we understand the nature of our arts, that Hamlet is not meant to be one performance. Human consciousness is not meant to be one book. Our perception of things is not meant to be one thing, but like the library, this relationship that as we strike the archetype, it will emanate into the qualities and conditions that are uniquely our own and yet reveal our greater human operating system, meaning that each of us are given a piano, so to speak. The music of our piano will be different, but the keys are the same. That's archetype. And that's what we'll learn with my work on the tarot as well. So we'll enter into this story. We are entering into my painted uh, cave, as I like to call it. I'm the last of the cave painters, actually. Um, paint, storytelling, and imagination. And I'm going to lead us through really this story of we ascend into the living library, into the mystery of the living library and the painted cave. And we are met as we ascend the stairs by uh, what you would say a guardian at the threshold, a great watcher that is saying that since you do not see my face, I'm not interested in personality, I'm interested in essence. I'm not interested in who you think you are in self-reflection, 
I'm interested in the darkness inside of you that has no face, but is the living principle you think of as yourself. So as you ascend these stairs, as you walk up into the painted library, remember that you are turning away from the face and time and back into the living library of the human form, divine. And so we enter now, and we're looking back down. We're going to look down, and at the base here of, of the Watcher, we see the Grail Cross. This will become a reoccurring theme of matter, the cross of matter, the square, the weave, and the circle, meaning that what we're going to understand is that like weavers, the tapestry of our human experience, our DNA is actually establishing in this repetition of time and, and history, a weave that will finally hold within each of us the revelation of the living library, what we think of as Christos, what we think of as, as uh, Bodhisattva, the mind of wisdom. And this is why it's very important what I'm showing you today is I did not have a conceit to do this. And so therefore it really is a matter of my home. It's a domestic truth. And when we're trying to get to the heart of myth now, it's saying, what is it where you live that you have to tell? Not what do you have to tell your neighbor and how you have to shout at him about how his politics are wrong, but actually where do you live? Where is it that you are with family? And so here we're going to enter up into the living library and we're going to start to see that it's painted on the floor, it's painted on the walls, it's painted even on the pillar here. And we're going to see this relationship because this painting of mind is called In the Mind of an Ancient God. And it's the story of the multidimensional nature of consciousness. And that we really are moving through all of these layers of the psyche as we ascend. And we're going to see how the room itself begins to take on. We'll see Eve on the pillar. We'll see the African Eve. We'll see this relationship to ascending the stairs. And what's beautiful about this is none of this is applied symbolism. It's not, this is a good idea, let me illustrate something. It's inherent symbolism. Like the 3D effect, which happens when you look at my art, was not expected. It's inherent. And that's very important from a mythic perspective. Because we're going to start to realize that as we enter, and we'll see here, do you see the paintings are even up on the ceiling? And this painting, Mysterium Conjunctionis, the mysterious conjunction, is this journey that takes us before the room, this is one of my oil paintings, of this journey from creation and the breathing out of really the womb of ideation into greater and greater complexity as we fall into the worlds of time, growing out of the root matter into the civilizations of our human experience. But that everything here, like the room itself, is saying we have been taught in all of these ages of discernment to separate. But essentially, when we look at everything from alchemical art, uh, Renaissance art, you think of the mur murals, why that's important was it was saying everything is going on at once here. So actually I'm a narrative that you enter. This is why all of our sacred sites are fixed. They're saying you are the sacred technology. As you step into relationship with me, I will trigger in you your deeper knowing because you are woven of this knowing. This is not a conceit of yours, it is your human inheritance. And this is why as we enter into Thoth's library, into the hieroglyph of the human soul, we, we start to see Sophia, this relationship we're going to see of the revelation of the grail, the chalice, the blossom, the knowledge of the great mother, Sophia, wisdom. We're going to see the story of the blossom and how this entire room then takes us on a type of visual story that isn't about learning more form. That's really the key here. It's saying that the form's done. What we've been taught, though, to create this world of form is to fear the imagination. Don't let what's inside of you out. If you do, you will be swept away from home. You will be swept into madness if you give in to your imagination. Keep it inside. And why this is very important is none of the form is dissolved here. The linoleum Sophia is painted on is still linoleum. The cabinet is still a cabinet. So the form hasn't changed. It's been able to actually grow a deeper relationship. And she's going to set the story of as we return home, we return to the knowledge of the mother, not simply the father, because archetypally the knowledge of the mother is I love, therefore I am. Archetypally the knowledge of the father is I think, therefore I am. And we are born of what? The mother and the father. So we are born of love and thought. Love, 
combines, connects. Thought separates, divides. And we are composed of these qualities. And that's why as she emerges up out of the depths, quite literally, she will show us this story of her greater beauty. And beauty is really the lost key of who we think we are. We think we can sort of just tough it out and get ever more quick in our technology. And this is actually saying, no, 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 you forget. Beauty is in the stillness of your heart. Beauty is when you remember that you are not constantly in motion. And that as Joseph Campbell said, once the hero's journey is over, and believe me, we have all been on the journey of individuation. We have gone into that dark forest. But the question isn't, how do we continue going into the dark forest? It's what do we do when we come back from the dark forest? How do we make sense of our story, not just for ourselves, but for our family? And for, on 9-11, that's what happened to me. I looked at my daughters and I said, I have to tell my daughters. I looked at my wife, I said, I have to tell my wife why it's they who have healed me. Not man, not science, not God, but love. And my first and all, my absolute priority is in the time remaining, is to begin to tell a story of why being human matters. Why it is a noble enterprise to be human. And regardless of the darkness and the difficulty, this is really the alchemy of our experience. Meaning it is burning away from us, and often painfully, that which really is not effective. And this is where she says, when the mother returns, I remind you that it is a time of forgiveness because I love all of my children. Not just you, not just your time, but all times, all ages. I am matter. Mater, mother, I am the weave of the whole and holy nature of creation. Only art can tell us this, because art says, you, I'm creation, and guess what? I'm asking you to love me. I'm not asking you to believe me. Isn't that freeing? Because belief demands that we be obedient to something. Love says, trust yourself. And that's when we become artists of consciousness. And this is where we see also the indicator here, above her, of the chalice, of the grail. This is over the spines of my books of religion and tradition. And isn't it an interesting idea that when we return home, because what is the technology of paint? That's the first technology, right? The first thing we did was touch the cave with paint, with pigment. And that was not to be illustrators of anything. That was to take our hands and put it in the rich earth. Do you see that feeling, the sensuality? And like connecting with the lover, the beloved, we put our hands on the cave wall because we weren't thinking it was a thing. We, thinking, we knew it was a consciousness of such ancientness that it had no lips, it had no mouth. We were its lips, we were its mouth. And its paint was our connecting skin with that great relationship. And this is why this really takes us back to the primary technology of paint, storytelling, and imagination and puts us in the relationship with it that says, you are the technology. Your human body is the outcome of this gathering of the great living library. And we go closer and we'll start to see how this relationship of the chalice, and it's very interesting because we'll see this infant at the center and this story that we are born in innocence and the vision of ancientness reaching into worlds that think of the heroism of a species that says, we will choose a book from the library. And what's fascinating is this book is the Encyclopedia of Religion. And I'm convinced we were some wandering, roaming, great species of consciousness that found this ancient library and we had picked out a book. I said, well, why don't you, Ted, why don't you pick out a book there? We'll, we'll embody that one and pick the Encyclopedia of Religion. So we incarnated into all of the questions. Think of a nobility of a greater species that said, listen, we don't stand outside of the question. We become the question. And we don't live just the easy part of the question. We live the entire question, meaning we are willing to be born into every role that that question creates. And that's why this sense of the chalice, then we back up. You can see the chalice here. But we'll also see Eve, the mother of generation, here on the pillar. And she's going to show us. And Puns. This is the other thing. My mom was a punster, so I'm a punster. You just, you, you just find. So I love that we're talking about because people go, well, the light of mind, the lamp of consciousness, and I love that this is a lamp. So when we stand with Eve, the mother of generation, we're literally standing with the light of mind above us. Only it's physical. It's not just uh, conceptual. 
And we move into, and she's going to tell us this story of the cross, of the chalice, of the womb, of life, and that the truth of generation is, she says, you are born, you are given this gift of life because truly you are opening up the eyes that realize ultimately your responsibility to this creation is in true relationship. That's why when we're standing with her, we're in relationship. And it's not her, it's not you. It's the qualities of the imagination between both that begins to tell a more interesting story of what possibly it means to be human. And that's why we can see how the room then will take us into the story of the chalice, the story of the light of mind projecting itself onto the books of religion and tradition in order to blossom above the mind of Sophia. But to do this, we're going to enter into the story of the phoenix, meaning we're going to enter into creation. I would love to say I'm this clever, but actually it's really like a kid that planted magical beans in the garden and went, I can't believe what's growing. Because I'll even applaud the work myself. I feel there's a, I remember listening to a jazz guitarist interviewed one time, and they said, well, what do you think of your music? He goes, sometimes it blows my own mind. <laughs> And that's how it feels. It's a riff. And, and as it takes the stage, we're going to realize this relationship of this right angle, of the journey of Sophia turning the corner into creation. And we're going to see, because here it's very important, that on the floor is all the painting. And as we see here this right and left, Sophia and this journey that we'll see into creation, there is a Christ or a father figure on the floor which tells us this remarkable beginning of our story of the divided self, that the blind eye and the scrolls, the knowledge of the Father, the knowledge of thought, is the blind eye of the law. But on the right, we see the open eye, and this is the knowledge of love, and that we have been on this journey of the knowledge of law, of love, of the Father and the Mother, and that the blind eye leads us into creation. And this is my mirror, as you can see, when we turn the corner away from Sophia into the mirror, we see the phoenix above, and we're taking the journey of the phoenix, meaning we are going to journey into a story that finally brings together Alpha Omega, the Alpha Omega, the seed and the blossom, the story of the phoenix, the story of the journey into creation in order to reach the end of self-reflection. And that's why in this studio of mine, when you get to the mirror, there's no further to go. You would look into the mirror and think there's another room, but once you got to the mirror, you'd realize, oh, no, 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 it actually was only in reflection, but that reflection drew me in. It drew me away, and it started to cultivate this dual self that we find above the mirror. And this is why I wanted to show you what the painting Phoenix Arise revealed to me because again, this is a type of mythic narrative that's revealing itself in the oldest form. What? Pictures. It's a picture book. And therefore, a picture book isn't saying, I have to interpret it the way I'm interpreting it, as much as saying, what if this is the awakening of a new languaging of these things? Because again, art is what? It's creation. But also, what is art? It's born of spontaneous creation. What are we? We're born of spontaneous creation creation. Like can only reveal like. This is actually suggesting that the human form, the human, human DNA, is an art form. And why I say this is I had this created, <coughs> excuse me, in card forms, and I dropped the cards and they mirrored each other. And there was a yoni between creation and creation, or lover and beloved. And I started to realize this was starting to tell me of a fractal holographic image that was beginning to say creation, mirroring creation, creates the possibility of birth, which is neither one or the other. But if we think of this shape also as the larynx, that is where we have in the beginning was the word. The important thing symbolically about the yoni in terms of, of, of tradition is that wherever we see this shape, it is actually telling us that this is the transposition of one quality or condition into another, meaning that when air passes through our larynx, it becomes sound. When light passes through the eye, it becomes vision. When we are born, we leave one condition and are born wholly into another one. And that's why when I put it together, it created, as we can see, a holographic double helix DNA weave coming from creation. Now, I love art, and the one thing I know is this has never happened before. There's never been a painting that actually reveals its story. This is called Phoenix Arise. Now, when I turned it this way, what becomes even more fascinating is we see the slit eyes 
and the slit mouth of the ancient alien face, the ET that we see so often. But I started to realize that if you think of yourself as a tree, we're trees that forgot we have roots. So we go no further than the floor of our assumption, I meaning we just don't go any deeper, because a tree also doesn't know that it goes beneath the soil. But why this is important, it's actually talking to our creativity. It's saying, what if your DNA is a fractal art form of creation? And that the way we transform ourselves is not by transforming the world, but by transforming the ideas about the world, because this is not our DNA personally, it is human DNA. And that's why each of us, each man and each woman, goes back to one woman and one man. We have to think about that mythically. Because that goes back to what I talked about, the tuning fork of Hamlet, right? Adam and Eve, so every woman is Eve. Every woman wears the sorrows of Eve. Every man is Adam. Every man wears the sorrows of Adam. And this is a quite a remarkable thing, because it's saying that our coat of many colors is our holographic fractal art form we call the DNA. And that's why when we go from here, we're going to find a most remarkable thing, because falling from this weave, we fall into time. But we're set in motion, because remember, in the beginning was the word? Well, the word is also verbum, meaning in the beginning was that which set in motion. Om, the breath. And as we fall, now look at what happens, because as this iterates, creation iterating creation, it finally comes full circle, just as in the story of the phoenix bird of immortality, and it reveals a nest. And as it revealed a nest, I realized that just as in the myth, once the nest is built, what happens? It erupts into flames. I pulled out the card, and it erupts into flames. This is impossible. So I kept pulling out the cards, realizing that I couldn't figure out how you would figure out how to figure this out. Um, I finally put it together. I pulled out all the cards, and it did not reveal random flames, but it blossomed. So we are seeing in good old ET language, or, or close encounters language, the language of mathematics, the language of fractals, the language of holographic iteration, we are seeing that creation creates all of its unique geometries and that it itself is going from a contracted or nesting stage, a gathering stage, to an expanded or blossoming stage. And that's good news because it turns out wherever this painting is opened, it doesn't blossom just one blossom, it opens infinite blossoms. And this is an original you can see. But this then, we will start to see how, wherever this painting is opened, it blossoms with infinite suns, S-U-N-S's. These look like Indian headdresses, don't they? They look like Indian baskets, don't they? Well, you know what the Hopis say? They say the knowledge of the sacred DNA is in our basket weave, and my home is on Shumash ceremonial ground. And I'm convinced it's a cave painting, meaning this is really the knowledge of the ancestors, because the Maya tell us that the fifth world is the age of flowers. And what if the age of flowers is not the age of roses and petunias, but the flowering of creation within each of us? That each of us have a unique identity, like a unique name in a book in the library, but each of us are woven of the living library. So our access to our greater library, our greater DNA, is our curiosity. And that's why, look at this, this is the agape mandala with 180 cards, and I had it out at 360 cards. It continued to build bigger and bigger and bigger. So think of that as this blossoming of creation, always blossoming uniquely, beautifully, with different geometries, so that the saying will be, is you don't enter time, you enter creation. You enter creation, so you blossom with unique geometries. If you enter creation at a different point, you blossom with different geometries. But in the future, like gardeners, we will see one another for the beauty of our differences. And at core, the unique realization that it is all creation, iterating, creating in each of us a lens, a particular languaging of a much greater beauty. And that's why, as I say, at the heart is the sun, S-U-N. So we are the sun returning to the phoenix knowledge. And this is why also in 2005, I had a visitor. And being cave painter, I realized that it wasn't conscious, but everything that has been happening to me that would possibly be out of the realm of normal, I've painted. I put into the matrix, well, what if I paint this? Because my dad was a painter, and he said, when you can't talk about it, paint it. And we know, we've all reached that place where, I, I know, but 
What do we do? It's, that's where a lot of this is, is really trying to affirm this relationship of the curiosity of the imagination. You will see this relationship of the, the heron over and over again in my work, and that's because on, in uh, January 30th, 2005, in my home, a great white heron was standing on my red uh, Persian rug in my living room as I was putting down my vision statement for Olandar Foundation for Emerging Renaissance, which is my home and the ideal of building a seed, a conscious ark. So I look at him and I say, well, things are very Harry Potterish around here. There's the back door, and he flew to the front door. And I said, I'm getting my camera. Friends already think I'm a bit over the edge. You know, come to the edge. Um, uh, so I did. Luckily, uh, luckily, I did get a camera, because as you can see, I took a picture of him at the front door. And then he jumped up behind the couch. And, and my wife, who wasn't home, and, and you know, we're, we're, we delight in one another, but even her, when I said, there was a great white heron in the house, knowing me, she said, metaphorically. And I went, no, 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 <laughs> literally. And, uh, and so, we, so the, the heron jumped down onto the couch and stayed there for 35 minutes. And I felt like I was in an Aesop's fable character. I was just, yeah. oh my, and I was down on my knees looking at this, and they're enormous. They're big birds, like pelicans. And he's looking, and this stern professor just looking at me, completely fearless. I'm the one that's panicking, and I'm thinking, okay, and I'd done a lot of lucid dreaming, and in that state you learn to be conscious and not fall unconscious. You become aware of, so I, 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 I blurted out, Thoth, which is the Egyptian uh, savant, and I'll show you his picture. And as I did, the bird looked at me and goes, look, 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 and, 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 I, and I just about pass out. And I say, I'm not really religious, but is this where someone appears in a puff of smoke? And I hear in my mind, absolutely not. You have the nature of consciousness all wrong. It has nothing to do with the human form and everything to do with the incipient pattern of intelligence which is within everything, and it flashed on the DNA. Now, why I mention this is that it said, as it went back, he said, you know me as a bird, yes, I'm a bird. You think of me as a symbol, of course I am, but what you do not yet realize is I am that quality of consciousness that ascends and returns, and the reason I don't speak to you with words is I teach you to trust your inner storyteller. And that's really what this conversation is about, learning to trust the inner storyteller. Because lo and behold, this figure here is Thoth, pronounced Thoth, but for our purposes, Thoth, because it turns out, 10 years into working on my, the hieroglyph of the human soul, I figure, well, what's the acronym? It turns out it is T-H-O-T-H-S, Thoths, just as the bird, so the bird the heron to the ancient Egyptians is the phoenix. So the phoenix returns to the home of the phoenix, and it's the story, finally, that will become iterated over and over again in my, uh, my story of ascension, which is this painting of mine. And as we start to see from ascension, we'll see how the heron becomes this reoccurring motif. This is the phoenix chair. So as we sit here, we actually realize the oceanic depths, this journey we have been on, and we'll see how it all flows into this journey of as above, so below, but even more interestingly, this relationship that we've been journeying across time to finally stand to trust the light of mind, meaning that it is not about getting somewhere else, it's about standing in a new relationship that allows us to hold the world of form and a greater sense of wonder. And that's why I call this the wonder study, and I just wanted to show you how this goes down onto the floor, it goes up onto the canvas, up onto the wall. We'll see how Newt here is vaulting over the ceiling. We'll see the relationship here again of Newt. Uh, and what I love is here's her face on the eye beam. And you have to love the pun. Yeah. I see her beauty when I beam. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no support for my home. And I think that this is why when symbolism is inherent, it's saying you don't have to make it up. Just think about what this is. This, this story takes us into this journey that will lead us around toward, here we'll see on the ceiling, these paintings of universe as organism. And of course, because there's not a lot of time I'll go into each of these, but it's to get a sense of the beauty 
and of this relationship of the greater archetypal landscapes that surround us as we embody ourselves in this greater theater. And we'll see the wheel here in the relationship to our oceanic self and the separation to finally have a relationship that has moved away from this painting of mine, which is really this relationship to what we think of as a type of womb-like environment, a type of interconnectivity that we are born from. And that's why we actually stand here in between this and this. We can see the mirror of self-reflection, the journey of the phoenix to blossom as the living library. And so from her or through her, we have this relationship of the library. And I wanted to share some of my Codex tour because like the room, the inquiry, and I think this is important for all of us, is that really the questions we ask demand different mediums. You know, some you ask with music, some with poetry, some with love, some with art, some with painting. And the Codex was a way of journeying into asking questions about the nature of consciousness and perception that took me into the realm of, I certainly was interested in black holes, but not the black holes in mathematical abstraction, but actually in the universe as organism, meaning who are we? How are we composed of these things? And I started to realize that the stars that we think we have to go out to, if we think holographically, it's not, there's no there there. By creating an analogy or a correspondence in our creative relationship, when the stars come here, do you see they're reborn, not as something, but as the relationship between that and this. And that's what we're seeking, is this essentially the relationship where the imagination is able to language itself, not because we're figuring out what to say, but because we're allowing it to be said. And so these are examples of my illuminated texts that were all journeys into the greater curiosity of why do we have all of this wiring the way it's wired. And I started to think in here about music beyond notes, about the rhythm of the sands, and that led to the question of the monad or a hieroglyph, like what is it about life? What is it, what's the meaning of the Pisces Aquarian age? And this started to tell me, it said, well, look at this. We begin as a type of tuning uh, monad, meaning that we're, we have certain unique capacities that are then put into the waters of time that unfold in a type of wiring system, the Piscean age of for and against reaction. But what the next page reveals to us is actually what's being revealed now, almost like you'd create the energy form to finally hold its greater story, like the blossom. And so we see the energies of the Aquarian mind emerging. And this then ended up with Cosmo Gramma and an artist, Flying Lotus, who is a remarkable genius, used this art for his album and the Cosmo Gramma. And these were different versions and visions of, of going deeper and deeper into consciousness, asking questions with a brush and pen that I couldn't ask with my thoughts. And really, like a musician, getting out of the way of the improvisation. This is very important, is that we have to teach improvisation, meaning that it's not just transferring data from another source, but that it's like life. It always, it is life. It wants to awaken. This was in relationship, I was in Mexico. It started to feel very Aztec-like, and I was inter interested in the place of location, the magical texts, the different use of mediums to really explore the different implications. Like, as I like to say, we are here, but that's another story for another day. Um, <laughs> and we had to go through there, but that's another story for another day. Um, and that the matrix of, of really this layering of information upon information and moving out beyond Alpha Centauri, but with a brush and pen. And then we come finally to the ancestors, to Phoenix Arise and this story that we will see in the tarot wheel, again, of the spiral of the spiral. And this is why in the imagination it says we need operating system or tools. But I wanted to show you, as I spent 17 years on these drawings, that they help us to understand that if we can consider the mind like a piano, and this is why they're keys, that we're composed of all these characters. We're a Shakespearean play inside of our head. And that's why when we're not taking sides, but understanding like the wheel, that all of these different aspects are aspects of our greater humanity. And that as Jung points out, that they all vie for attention in our consciousness. Which is why I really wanted as an actor, as a human being, tools. I didn't want beliefs. I wanted to know how do I navigate this crazy instrument of this mind of mine. And this was, is, has been so helpful because once we move into the archetypal, we're able to see these qualities not simply as personal. We're actually able to see them 
as the characters that, although they might manifest differently in you than in me, are still the same characters. And what's really helpful is we start to see how these characters also populate the outer world and that we can ar begin to understand archetypally, like the archetype of death, temperance, the devil, the tower. These are amazingly difficult archetypes that we all experience. And if we take the energy personally, we go, God, why are you being so mean to me? As opposed to understanding the alchemy. It's the sculptor saying, I am removing the stone from you that is occluding your beauty, and you think the stone is you. So all you feel is the pain. Do you see? And that's important. That's the tower. And the star, then, she opens up these stories of the worlds within worlds, and the moon will bring us on the journey of the wisdom of the blood. And this, because my journey into the feminine archetypes was not to illustrate anything, but much more from the actor's perspective of what may I learn from you, all of these have been conversations that have led to a deeper examination of our story. Most fascinating here is my world archetype is dated 9-11-1986. And we see the twin towers. And the story here is the falling away of the old binary to release the knowledge of the deep feminine within us, which says, you are an ancient tree. I remind you that you are the outcome and grow from all worlds simultaneously. When you know this, you will trust this eye, this sense of wonder, not simply these two eyes, the eyes of form. And you will stand finally overcoming your fear of death. Because it's only the optical, it's only the formal self that believes in death. The knowledge of wonder, the knowledge of our greater story, realizes there is no death. And so that's why we end with the fool in terms of the time. And we'll move into the feminine archetypes to bring this to a close, because I didn't want to go into all the story of them, but to just get a sense of what's been flowing up. This is a Splendor. She's on the floor. This is the knowledge of God the Mother. Interestingly enough, her position of her arms, she's in the same position as God the Father on the institutional space of the Sistine Chapel. This is on linoleum in domestic space where we find the Mother, meaning she's painted on what? The most ordinary surface. And she tells us that our mythic problem is we think we're linoleum. If only I were gold, then I'd be worth something. And she says, no, 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 don't confuse. That's just a different element. What's golden in you is your imagination. You can transform even the most base, the linoleum of yourself, not by turning that linoleum into gold, but using it as the ground to support your unique imagination. And that's why, again, this has to be in a home. Only where we live, only where we're intimate, only where we're naked with each other can we know these things. Otherwise, we're armored because we're fighting with the neighbor. And the question at home is, even if we're arguing with each other, how do we do this together? How do we navigate? And that's why she's coming up from our depths to remind us of the ark, that across the ages, we've been gathering from the living waters our story that finally will lead to reveal Lilith, the veiled one, the knowledge of the goddess. But that's another story for another day. Very interesting, very important story. Uh, <laughs> and uh, she's painted, as we'll see, on the back of a canvas. So she's actually hidden. And I love that, the hidden side. And this is the oceanic mother who will set in motion. We'll start to see this story of birth and the story of, the, again, the grail mother, the dual self that's finally born of this journey of the library of life, and that through generation, through the mother, we are finally holding the library of our greater wisdom. But to do this, we had to take the adventure of birth, of matter, mater, mother, of time, and that we'll see here again with this journey of Eve, the heron, and the African Eve, the first mother. And this will be repeated in the room again with the African Eve and Eve on the pillars. So we have this relationship between that and the artwork, which was not expected. And then we go back to Sophia. We'll see in her crown, again, the relationship of the mother and the father, the two hemispheres, the knowledge of cycles and time, and a lamp on the wisdom of the ages. But through the mother, she says, I remind you, you are not born. You do not travel universes through machines. You travel universes through wombs. If it takes 100 million years to get to the nearest star, you've got it all wrong. There's no there there in a hologram. Be here now. Be home. You are the center of the universe. And that's extraordinary, because that's balancing these two hemispheres, these two qualities in a greater unity. 
And this was Quan Yin who appeared, and you'll see this repetition of the watcher, this figure over and over again. This is the language that appeared on 9-11, so I'm following, not drawing her, I'm following this rhythmic pulse that finally becomes Quan Yin, who tells me when I'm drawing her that the waters are returning home to where we live, and that we will finally realize, as she said, energy is not objective, it is sentient. When you realize that all is sentient, you will begin to honor that all is necessary to the weave of life. All is whole and holy. Every cell and every atom is essential. And that as matter, mater, mother, I love all my being. And this is on the books, on the floor. And we see Tor, this relationship of the uh, as above, so below. I'll just show you the last of these slides. Uh, Eve, finally the life is not just the Vitruvian man of measurement, but the gift of life. And we see Lilith and Eve and Sophia, the chalice and the chalice and the blossom. We see Lilith hidden behind the blossom, it closes. And finally we end up with Mothership, who is going to take us on a journey that through birth we are given this gift of the apple, the unique artistry of human consciousness and its unique responsibility. And we are born into this world. And as we'll see, her story shows us the story of the tears of the mother, meaning that on this great journey of separation in order to blossom, you must finally understand the arc of the ancestors, the great vision of which you have been born that shows us the chalice. We'll see again the grail, the mother. We are born as male and female, but her hips show us the head of the hummingbird, here its beak, and here we see its wings. She says, you are learning to achieve stillness while in motion like the hummingbird. This will allow for the ancient vision of the entirety, you see this kachina, this great generosity of your being that says, finally, trust your home and understand that you are woven of the entire story of being human. You left home in order to find out who you were uniquely, but what it happened was that we translated our ancient Akashic library, which had big golden books that nobody understood, where gods we had to worship in the great elsewhere. We have finally translated and transformed our Akasha into the human library, meaning that when we stand in a human library, we don't see the outcome of worshiping the elsewhere. We see the outcome of human beings in the darkness and difficulty of their time and ages who still said yes, who st still said, I am willing to stand up and add to this. Because remember, our dear Beethoven was deaf when he wrote the Ode to Joy. That tells us something about the mighty heart of our human character and why I'm so proud to be one of you and with you because I think our humanity is the greatest art form in creation. We both love and we think we can hold unique identity and the knowledge of shared reality. And when that happens, we don't try to leave home. We don't try to go elsewhere because what my home proved to me is when we ascend into the living library in the painted cave, we're not swept away from home. Ascending did not mean leaving those we loved. It meant being amplified by the greater story. So when we descend back into our home, we share with them our hopes for the future, not our despair about the things that might have worked out differently. And anyway, thank you very much. And uh, that's my talk. <laughs> thank you. I'm going to get proclaimed. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>